Torah tells us, V'asu li migdash v'shachanti b'soicham. God tells the Jewish people, make for me a dwelling place, and I will dwell amongst them. And then the Torah goes on to speak about the various vessels that we are to build in the sanctuary. And the first of those vessels is called the Aram, or the Holy Ark. This is a picture of the Holy Ark. It's a box with two staves and then you have the kurubim here on top this is called the arona kodesh the holy ark and the rambam tells us that there's a mitzvah mitzvah number 20 to build the holy temple and this includes the vessels as the rambam goes on to say the menorah the table the altar and all the other parts of the sanctuary then the Rambam tells us in Path of Commandment 34 that when it comes to the carrying of the Holy Ark that the Kohanim had to carry the Ark by placing the poles on their shoulders and the Kohanim had to be facing each other when they carried the Ark. There wasn't two Kohanim that were in front and two Kohanim that were in back that were leading but rather they had to stay face to face. And each one placed the staff on his shoulder. Mm -hmm. There were two of them next to each other facing the kuruvim. On the other side there were another two kohanim also placing the uh, staff on their shoulder facing the kuruvim and that's the way they walked face to face. Oh. And from here our rabbis derive that when you walk away from the holy ark you shouldn't turn your back to the ark in the synagogue, but also step backwards. Your face should always be facing the Aaron Kodesh, the holy ark. So this is the pshat. The simple interpretation of the mitzvah is, number one, when the Kohanim carry it, it should be face to face. Number two is, there's a mitzvah not to remove the staves from the ark. Even after the ark was standing, in the Holy Temple, in the Holy of Holies, you are not allowed to take those two sticks out of the sides of the Ark. Now, if the whole purpose of the sticks was to carry the Ark from place to place, why is it that the sticks must remain in the Ark at all times? In contrast to other vessels in the Holy Temple, like, for example, the altar, the Mizbeach, or the shulchan, or the table that was in the holy temple. When it came to moving those vessels, then you placed the staves into those vessels and you moved them. When you brought it to its destination, you took the staves out of those vessels. Only the Aaron Kodesh, the holy ark, had to have the staves at all time in the actual vessel. And thirdly, there was also a crown, a kesser, that surrounded the ark, implying kesser Torah, the crown of Torah. And as our commentaries tell us that when it comes to the crown of kingship, you can't inherit, you can only inherit that crown. You have to be born a king. Your father has to be a king. Your grandfather has to be a king. When it comes to kuhuna, to priesthood, again, you have to be born a Kohen. You can't be made a Kohen. But the crown of Torah is something that every person can acquire. Every Jew has the ability to study Torah and acquire this level of Keser Torah. This is the pshat, the simple interpretation of the Aaron of the Ark. What is the remez, the hint? As you know, there is five levels to every mitzvah in the Torah. This pshat, the simple level, and rem is the hint, and drush, the homiletics, soy, the esoteric, and chasidus, the chasidic interpretation as well. So what is the rem is? The kliyakar goes on to explain why we have the staves in the ark. What is the purpose of having these two staffs, or these two sticks, on the side of the ark at all times? And he gives two interpretations. One is that 
we know that two sons of Jacob, Yisachar and Zuvulun, made a pact between each other. Zuvulun was a businessman, and Yisachar studied Torah all day. So Zuvulun told Yisachar, look, I will pay for you, I will support you to study Torah all the time, and we will split the merits of your Torah study. Now, of course, Zavulin had to pray three times a day, and Zavulin also had to study Torah at least twice a day. But Yisachar was dedicated to the study of Torah all the time. And therefore, Zavulin would give half of his earnings to Yisachar so that Yisachar would be able to continue his dedication to the knowledge of Torah. And so says the Kliyakar is the concept of these two staves in the side of the ark. They represent those that support the Torah, hold up the Torah. These are the people who donate to the synagogues, who donate to the yeshivas, who allow children who cannot afford a Jewish education, a scholarship, so that Torah continues to travel. Torah continues to live on for all generations, even after, God forbid, the destruction of the Holy Temple. Another interpretation is that these staves represent the study of Torah. And that is, even after the temple was destroyed, the Jews still have the obligation to study Torah. And primarily, the word Bade in Hebrew, Beis Dalid Yud, which means staves, if you add up the Beis and the Dalit and the Yud, Beis is two, Dalit is four, Yud is ten. That equals 16. There are 16 people who get called to the Torah every week. Shabbos morning, you have seven aliyahs. Shabbos afternoon for Mincha, you have three more. And then Monday and Thursday. So on the average week, you have 16 people who get called to the Torah. They have a bad day ha'aron. They are the staves of the aron. And furthermore, these staves had to be covered by zahav, by gold. What is the letters of gold? Zion, Hey, Bez. Zion is seven, Hey is five, Bez is two. When do we read the Torah? Shabbos, Monday, and Thursday. Or Monday, Thursday, and Shabbos. Which are the three letters of the word Zav. Implying by the fact that the Jewish people will continue to learn the Torah and be called to the Torah these three days of the week, Monday, Thursday, and Shabbos, and a total of 16 people who are called to the Torah. Through this, the Torah, the Aaron, the Holy Ark, will continue to journey throughout all the generations and be a force where the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, will truly rest. It's interesting to note that the size and the dimensions of the Ark are two and a half by one and a half. They are incomplete numbers. Now everything in the temple had to be complete. And the other vessels were complete. But yet when it comes to the dimensions of the Holy Ark, it says, Shnayim v'chetzi arkoi v'amav v'chetzi rachboi. It was two and a half amos by one and a half amos. Why are the amos, the measurements, incomplete? And here too we are told to remind us that when a, a Jew studies Torah, he must realize that he never mastered the entire Torah. He must always be humble. As it says every day in our prayers, V'nafshi ka'afra la kerl tia, let our soul be like the dust of the earth. And then, P'sach libi b'sodesecha, open up my heart to your Torah. To be a vessel, to receive the Torah, we have to be a broken vessel, we have to be incomplete. Once we become arrogant, we think we know everything. Oh, I know that already and I mastered the entire Torah, there's no room to learn more Torah. And God says, I cannot dwell upon someone that is arrogant, only one that is humble. And therefore, the Ark, which is the source of Torah, tells us the Torah, the dimensions are incomplete, reminding us of this level of humility and realizing no matter how much Torah study one acquires, one has never truly mastered the entire Torah. So this is the remez, this is the hint of the, the ark. What is drush? What is the homiletics? What is the halacha when it comes to the ark? The Torah tells us in this week's Torah portion, in the portion of Truma, 
When it talks about the building of the ark, it says, Venesata es akapoides al ha'orin. You shall build this box, and on top of the box, you are to place a kapores, a covering. And then it says, V'el ha'orin tito ines ha'edus. And inside the box, what do you put inside that box? You put the luchos. You put the tablets, the Ten Commandments that God gave Moses on Sinai. That is where you place the Ten Commandments inside that box. So the question is, why does the Torah say, first you shall put the covering on the ark, and then it says you shall place the tablets inside the ark. It should be the opposite. First, you put the tablets inside the ark, then you put the covering on top of the ark. So we have a machloikis. We have two opinions. We have Rashi, and we have the Ramban. Rashi tells us that really the box and the covering are two separate vessels. And therefore the Torah tells us, you have the covering, that's one vessel. And then you have another vessel, a box, and inside the box you put the tablets. According to the Ramban, according to Nachmanides, it's only one vessel. And therefore the Torah is telling us that the vessel is only complete when you put the covering on top of the vessel. But if the covering is not on top of the vessel, you don't have the ark. Now, what is the nafka min halacha? What is the difference when it comes to halacha? So there will be two basic differences. Number one, when you build a vessel in the holy temple, you have to have in mind that you're doing this lishma. You're doing this for the sake of this vessel. And the same is true today when you, when you make tefillin. You can't just put tefillin through a machine. You have to have in mind, I am doing this l'shem mitzvah tefillin. I'm, I am now taking the leather for the sake of fulfilling the mitzvah of tefillin. When you make matzah on Pesach, you roll the matzah and you say, as you make the matzah, l'shem matzah is mitzvah. I am doing this for the sake of the matzah of mitzvah. Now, the same is true when you build these vessels in the Holy Temple. You had to have in mind and actually articulate, I am building this vessel for the sake of this vessel. Now what do you say? Says Rashi, when you build the box on the bottom, you have to say, I am building this, the shame mitzvah's Aram. I am building this for the sake of the mitzvah of the ark. When you build the top piece, the covering, it's a separate vessel. You have to have in mind the shame, mitzvah's kapoides. I am building this for the sake of building the covering, a separate vessel. According to the Ramban, it's one vessel. So when you build the box and when you build the top of the box, the covering, you can say, I am now building the Ark of Mitzvah even when you build the covering for the ark. You can say, I am building the ark of the mitzvah. It's one vessel. The ark and the covering are one item. Another difference. There's a prohibition to copy, to be a copycat. There's a prohibition to copy the vessels of the holy temple according to its dimensions. We are not allowed to make now a ark or a menorah the same exact size as it was in the holy temple. So now, if I make the aron for the holy temple, when do I violate this commandment, not to copy the ark? According to Rashi, being that it's two separate vessels, once I make the box on the bottom, without making the cover, already I violated the prohibition not to copy the vessels of the Holy Temple. According to the Ramban, being that the bottom and the top are one vessel, if I simply make the bottom box, I did not yet violate the commandment. 
I first need to make the bottom box and the top covering. Only then do I violate the prohibition not to copy the vessels of the Holy Temple. This is Drush. Soid, the esoteric. We find a very interesting story in the book of Samuel. It says over there that King David wanted to move the Holy Ark up to Ir David. So what did he do? He made this beautiful new wagon pulled by oxen and he put the Ark on to the wagon and they began to pull the Ark to his destination. And of course, while they did this, they were accompanying the Ark with dancing and singing and music. And all of a sudden, they see the Ark is falling off the carriage. So Uzzah jumps to catch the Ark. As Uzzah jumps to catch the Ark, God strikes down at Uzzah and Uzzah dies. David is very upset. How come Uzzah died? But he goes on with life. The question is, why did Uzzah die? He wanted to do something good. He wanted to protect the ark. Says the commentaries, Uzzah lost faith. He thought the ark is going to fall. God's ark, where the tablets are inside, are going to fall. On the contrary, it says that the ark would carry those that carried it. So therefore you think the ark is going to fall on the floor? And therefore you had no right to go and try to save the ark. That's one interpretation. But the Gemara in Saita gives another interpretation. The Gemara in Saita says this was actually a penalty and a punishment to King David. King David said something very wrong. What did he say? What was so terrible? That King David said that because of this, this terrible tragedy happened. King David said, God, your statutes, your mitzvos are beloved by me like a song. Isn't that terrible? Isn't that a terrible thing that he said? Why is that so terrible? What did King David do wrong by saying, Zemirah is hayuli chukecha, your statutes are like a song to me. So comes along the Tzemach Tzedek and Chassidus and Kabbalah and explains it as follows. When it comes to a mitzvah, there are two levels of a mitzvah. Number one is every mitzvah is equal. It is God's ratzon, it's God's will. And number two, every mitzvah has a deeper connection, and that is every mitzvah is tanug, every mitzvah is pleasure. And the pleasure of one mitzvah is different than the pleasure of another mitzvah. And how do we have the pleasure of a mitzvah? By understanding the reasons behind the mitzvah. And by understanding these reasons and these details and the ramifications of the mitzvah, this creates a true pleasure when we perform that mitzvah. Dovra Melech says, look, the mitzvahs are to me like statutes. Statutes mean a mitzvah that has no explanation. And it's like a song. When you take a song and you sing over the melody one time, two times, three times, you don't get bored after the second and third time. You have the same enjoyment the second time and the third time like the first. So King David says, you know, even though I don't understand the mitzvahs, but it's like a song. I still get enjoyment when I do it once and twice and three times. And when I do all the mitzvahs, I get enjoyment like singing a song. But it's a limited enjoyment. It's an enjoyment that comes about from doing a mitzvah and not understanding what I'm doing. It's only fulfilling God's will, not acquiring God's pleasure. So God says, what? You say my mitzvahs are only divine will? You don't say that my mitzvahs are divine pleasure? Because of that, 
I'm going to cause you to sin. I'm going to cause you to sin to make a mistake that even a five-year-old child knows. He knows that when you carry the ark, you don't put it onto a wagon. You put it on the shoulders of the Kohanim. Now, how does the penalty fit the crime? What's the connection? Here's where Kabbalah comes in. Says Kabbalah that the luchos, the luchos, the tablets that were in the ark, any side that you looked at it was the face. Even though it was engraved, there was no back, there was only a front. Any side, I turned the luchos, it was the front of the luchos. Only panim, only face, v'loy achar, not back. And that's why, when the Kohanim carry it, they have to carry it face to face. They are now becoming an extension of the Ark. An extension of those luchos, of those tablets that are found within the Ark. That only had a face, and had no back. And therefore, they had to carry the Ark face to face, not face to back. And the same is true with every mitzvah. The pleasure of the mitzvah, that is the face of the mitzvah. The obligation of the mitzvah is the back of the mitzvah. Because the obligation is the same for every mitzvah. It's God's commandment. It's like looking at a person's back, it's all the same back. Where do you see a difference when you look at the face? The characteristic is in the eyes, in the nose, in the mouth, in the complexion. That's the details of the mitzvah. That's the pleasure of the mitzvah. That's the face of the mitzvah. So therefore, because King David said that the mitzvahs are chukim, are statutes, they have no pleasure. The only divine will, the only the back of God, not the face of God. God says, you know what? You're going to sin. You're going to forget to do the mitzvah. That the Kohanim carry the ark face to face. Furthermore, forgetfulness is from the back. In the face is no forgetfulness. If you're looking at God face to face, you don't forget. Shikha is when you turn your face away, then you forget. When you're looking face to face, there's no forgetfulness. And therefore, because David said the mitzvahs are like the back, not the face, he forgot. He forgot the mitzvah that had to be done face to face by the Kohanim carrying the ark. This is the soid. This is the esoteric level of the mitzvah. What does Chassidus say? Hasidus asks a question, and that is, what is the func function of the ark? What's the purpose of the ark? All the vessels in the temple served a purpose. The altar you brought animals upon. The golden altar you brought incense upon. The menorah you, you lit up every night with candles. The shulchan, you put on bread every week. Every vessel, every keli in the holy temple served a purpose. What is the purpose of the ark? What are we doing with the ark? It says Chassidus that there are three different dimensions to the ark. There's the box, there's the covering, and there are the Kuruvim, the cherubs, the angels that are on top of the ark. And each one represents a different concept. First is the box. The box is the place where we store the tablets. And according to many in commentaries and opinions in the Talmud, we also put the Sefer Torah that Moses wrote into the ark. So this ark represents the Torah. That's why it's called the Aron Hoidus, the Ark of Testimony. 
It was a testimony that God gave the Torah to the Jewish people. And as we said many times, three million Jews witnessed God's revelation at Sinai. We all saw God. It's not a religion of belief. We all saw God face to face on Sinai. Other religions, that one person came and said he had a bad dream or something. God came to him and revealed himself and now is conveying the idea. Judaism, every single Jew saw God. And the whole world heard the Ten Commandments. So the, the Ark of the Eidos is a testimony that God gave the Torah to the Jewish people. What is the kapoidus? What is the covering? Says the Torah, the purpose of the covering is v'nei v'nei I will make myself known to you through that covering. When God spoke to Moses, he came over that covering. So the covering was a communicator, like a, tra a transistor, where God would communicate with Moses and then the Jewish people. What is the concept of these two cherubs? Tells us Rashi, what was the face of these cherubs? How did it look? Says Rashi, it was the face of children. And Rabbeinu Bechayi says more specifically, the face of a young boy and the face of a young girl. These were the two Kuruvim face to face. And furthermore, the Gemara tells us that when the Jewish people came up to the Holy Temple three times a year, the Kohani would open up the curtains of the Holy of Holies and they would tell the Jews, look, look at the Ark, look at the Kuruvim, look at these two faces and look how the wings are covering each other as man and wife are having intimacy. This is the way God loves you. He loves you without any intermediary. He loves you like husband and wife. That is the love that God has for the Jewish people. And as the Maggot of Azrich explains, why specifically the face of a young boy and the face of a young girl could have been a mature man and a mature woman. Because this expresses the love even more so. The love that a parent has to a young child is an unconditional love. He's a little cute kid, a little cute girl running around, you love them, they're so sweet, they're so beautiful. Oh, look at my child, he's amazing. What did he do? Why is he so amazing? Did he, did he find a cure for cancer? Did, did, he, did he make a 10 million? Oh, this kid, he's unbelievable. What's so unbelievable? He's your kid, that's what's unbelievable. He's so cute, you don't care about how smart he is, you don't care how rich he is, you don't care if he's gonna make a scientific breakthrough, it doesn't matter, he's your baby, you love him. An older child, well, he's a doctor, he's a lawyer, he's a professor, he's a scientist, already the love becomes limited to the actions. But uh, the love that God has for every Jew is a love that a parent has for a child, which is an unlimited love. So the Ari represents three levels. Number one, the Torah. There are 613 commandments in the Torah. God chose us, he gave us the Torah. There are positive commandments, negative commandments, and we try to do our best. Sometimes we make a mistake. We violate the commandment. We break a law of the Torah. Comes the Kaporis and brings atonement. The word Kaporis means Kapara. What's the atonement? The atonement is because we are Jewish people. We are on top of the Torah. We protect the Torah. We are God's children. Our source is higher than Torah. The love that God has for a Jew is unconditional. It's unconditional to what we have accomplished. It's unconditional to how much knowledge we have. It's unconditional to how many good deeds we have performed. And therefore, when we go to our source, when we come back to who we are, and we regret the mistakes that we have performed, then God forgives us. If you look at the Torah, the Torah says you made a mistake, you get punished. 
But if you go to the source of the soul, where the soul is truly part of God, then when I regret what I did, God says, Kapara, you're, you have an atonement. And furthermore, we know that the place that a Balchuva stands, even a complete Sadiq cannot stand. In other words, a place where a BT is, a Balchuva is higher than an FFB, a from from birth. Why? Because the Gemara says if you do tshuva out of love, then those sins themselves become mitzvos, become good deeds. And that is the kapara, that is the atonement, that is the protection, that is the cover over the Torah. To protect the Torah. The love that every Jew has to God. The fact that we are chilek, elikam, and mal mamish, we are truly part of God Himself. So this is the basic idea of the Holy Ark. And we are told that even today when the temple is destroyed, that the Ark was hidden under the Holy Temple Mount. And the Ark is still there. And the holiness is still there. And the connection is still there. And therefore, by studying our Torah, and by performing our mitzvot, and connecting with God, we are truly connecting to this Aaron. We are truly connecting with this Ark. And therefore we hope and pray that our eyes should see very soon the rebuilding of the Holy Temple when the Shekhinah, the Divine Presence, will truly return to the Holy Temple with the rebuilding of the Third Holy Temple with the coming of Mashiach speedily in our days.